Hello, everybody, and thank you for watching Chad Smith Podcast. What a great podcast. There's two parts to it, so be sure to check out part one and part two, and check out Chad Smith Legends. This book is fantastic. I can't wait for you guys to see it. It's available in hard copy and an Amazon Kindle. And part of the Legend series, we have Neil Peart, Alex Van Halen, and four other legends. Of course, Modern Drummer back issues are available on our website, moderndrummer.com. And as always, please hit the link below, subscribe to Modern Drummer YouTube. We'll keep bringing you the world's greatest drummers because you're the world's greatest drumming community. I'm David Frangioni, and we'll see you soon. And yeah. what do you think, when you look back, what is it that allowed you to keep your feet on the ground and keep the gig and not go sideways? Yeah. Was it a combination of the age that you were at? You had yeah. already kind of gone through some of that stuff. Yep. So you were a little bit more mature. Yeah. A little. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I said a little. Thank you. Uh, I'll emphasize a little. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think, so, I think, I think was that I had played, what? I think that I'd played in, and been in lots of different situations. Um, and I being, you know, by, by our time, 1991, I was 29 okay. years old. Yes, you're so a man. I'd been, and, and, and it kind of was a more gradual thing, but um, I never got into I mean, early on in music, I just because I started so young, I, I wasn't. In, I wasn't. I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be a drummer and a musician. I, I, I didn't. Yeah, when I was a teenager and stuff, I, I was like, "Oh, it'd be cool to be like Led Zeppelin on their private plane, drinking Jack Daniels." Like the pictures I see in the magazines, I like, like romanticized about that. Looked pretty cool, but I wasn't in to be like a rock star. I just I loved music and and I loved all kinds of music and. Not just drumming, just like so. The trappings and all that wasn't the thing that I, that was really like. So I feel like that part I didn't get too sucked up into. I did my share. I didn't. I wasn't a prude and wasn't like didn't go home. Like I fucking went for it for a while, but I never. To the point of where, like you know, it never overtook you. No, the to gig where, and everything where, else. Like, the devil Maybe personally, won. a little bit. I was a little selfish. I like, yeah. At a certain point, I was. I would like. I felt like I could. I was bulletproof. I could do whatever. <laughs> and it would. That's being immature. And 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 so I was a little self-centered. I was at definitely certain at certain time, but you know that's like we were talking. It's, it's, it's ups and downs, and you learn, and you oh fuck. That's not good. That doesn't work for and me. And you changed, and right? You if you course correct, then it's a lesson. You can do that. Yeah. Some people don't. But right. it's important to have good people around you and go, hey, what are you doing? You're fucking up. Oh, shit, really? Yeah, you are. Oh, okay. Maybe I should look at that. And so, yeah, I have, I've always had good friends that would be like, that knew, know me and, and not afraid to, Tell it like it is, which is and, important. And that was a big part. And your upbringing, it sounds like your parents were, yeah. you had a beautiful family, like you had that foundation. Yep. Yeah. That goes further than we realize. It does. <laughs> but my mom, my, 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 my dad was, he was, he, um, he loved me, you know, he loved music. He was shocked. Like, I remember early on, he came to a concert we were playing. I think it was like New Year's Eve in San Francisco kind of early on in the band, maybe 90, 91, 990. And like 10,000 people came from the Civic Center. And just looking at us and we're fucking doing our fucking crazy shit. And he's looking at the crowd and they're going nuts and people are stage diving and they're fucking <laughs> moshing. And he's just like, and he came to me after we're saying, hey, did you have a good time? He goes, yeah. He goes, I don't really understand it. I don't, I don't, but it seems to be that they're really enjoying what you're doing. I don't understand the music that you're doing. I'm like, you're not supposed to, Dad. Right. It's all good. He goes, but it looks like you're having fun. I go, we're having a blast. He goes, good for you, then. That's great. I'm uh, proud. So he, like, didn't get it, but got the bigger picture. Yeah. And, um, but 
you know, the, just back to my father, he, in the house growing up, um, he would play his three, he was, grew up in West Virginia, but his three major artists were Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, and Johnny Cash. So those rotated on the turntable quite a bit, and then other stuff would be thrown in, um, mostly like country, like George Jones and Patsy Cline and Charlie Pride and like he had a he he liked sort of the pop country of the day, yeah. but and I'm like fuck it's old people's fucking music <laughs> damn who Elvis you know okay I get it the King of Rock and Roll who cares and like Frank Sinatra really. And, you know, Johnny Cat, what is this? And little did I, I'm like Black Sabbath, and, you know, I'm cranking fucking volume four up as loud. But it's normal to want you and have your own music. You don't want to listen to your parents' music. Right. But I was lucky that that was such good quality. Like, he had good taste. Yeah. You know? And so, like, I obviously to this day love that music. But um, it's it's interesting that, that, you know, he did have an influence on me, but he... He just was, yeah, but he, they were always supportive. To your point, my parents were, yeah, even when I would get in a lot of trouble and they would, couldn't have the car, couldn't go out, couldn't do this. They never took away my drums, which was a nice That's thing. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah they, they loved could have. They loved you through it. Yes, they did. They did, because they could, that would have been really, I might have burned down the house or something. <laughs> Well, thank God they didn't take them though. No, and and you, we were talking earlier. Your mom is ninety-seven as mm. we record this. So God bless her. What a life! God bless her. What a life, Joan. Almost what a century. A life. Almost a century old. Amazing. Unbelievable. So then the Chili Peppers go through the nineties. All of the we're really getting the history in here, David. Well, yeah, we're, we're just, going through well, the whole thing. We're staying high level though. We're staying high level because okay. if we got into the weeds, there's so many stories. <laughs> as we leave the nineties, right? We'll go through the whole decade quick. You play Woodstock '99. Yes, and that we played '94, but we played in '99. Yeah, '94. I remember '94. That was Aerosmith played there too. You're right, Metallica, and so that I yeah, was, yeah. That's when I was in their world, and then '99. Um, there's a documentary I right. watched recently, uh, yeah, which I heard is where about I that, really yeah. got some insight to it. Do you remember the gig? the same way that this documentary is told or was it were you guys just kind of in and out of the we game we were we were in and out the only thing like they asked us if we wanted to be interviewed for that and i kind of knew where that was going like i was like no nah, i'm not gonna get no nope, yeah. nope nope um we were i think we were the last day of that festival oh was it the last day i think it was the last day when it was really about to literally burn to the ground yeah. and go crazy okay. and we i remember we were at the hotel there was like a um where kind of all the bands were staying and some of the people were coming and so the night before we were there and i, I remember i can't remember who it was like dave matthews or somebody was like ask you getting kind of weird out there you know i was like yeah it was, it was like an army base oh yeah and right. and it was it, yeah it was just it very greed I, I didn't see the film you were talking about but some people have come up to me and asked me about it. But the part, our part, so I don't know how it was portrayed in the movie, but um, so we get there and later afternoon we're, we go on, we're at the end, so I don't know what time that was. It was dark, probably 9 o'clock. And we're just in the back and hanging out and everything seemed to be okay. Um, and we're in a trailer and Jimi Hendrix's sister comes in. We've met her before a couple of times. And she says, you know, they're doing a hologram of my brother after you guys perform of the Star Spangled Banner. He's doing his, his version from the 69. I said, oh, awesome, great. She's like, you know, I, what do you think? It'd be really cool. I know you do some of my brother's music. You know, if like a song, if you played a song right before that and it kind of segued in, it'd be kind of cool. We're like, oh, okay, great. And she was awesome and the whole thing. So we're like, okay. So... We'd been on tour, but we hadn't been playing. We do Fire by Jimmy Hendrix, Cross Down Traffic. We do Castles Made of Sand. We do lots of Hendrix stuff. and But we hadn't played anything in a while, so it was like, well, maybe we should do Fire. We should, we, you know, yeah, we're looking at each other. We're in the thing. No one's got any instrument. We're plugged in, so I'm like, eh, 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 eh. 
we're going through the arrangement like literally like this. In you know, me, Anthony said, we get through the song. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll do it. Okay, great. That was it. So we go play the show. I remember going right before we went on. Please stand in front of me, and that guy's making an announcement. So chili pepper, and he's like, he, I think he had like his he, at that time he used to play in like white, his like tidy whitey underwear. He's like, should I play naked? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> great, yeah, absolutely. So the whole show, he's naked. The whole show, and I'm like, I think there's this is like on MTV or something or whatever, you know. <laughs> Like, he didn't give a fuck. So that's where we were, like, in 99, I was kind of, you know, we were... Still wild. You know, yeah. free, free. Yeah. And it was fun, and we played. It was going great. Um, dark out, so you couldn't really see too much past, like, the, you know, 100 yards or whatever. But this field went, like, a mile. It looked like a mile. It was, like, huge. <clears throat> and so towards the end of the set... Um, we start to see this like way far away, like a little fire, you know, like a little, it looked like a, from where we were at, like a hamburger stand grease fire. It's like nothing, like a little thing. And the promoter or, or stage manager, somebody came on and said, yeah, we need to make an announcement. Like, okay, comes on. And he's like, can you let the firemen come in? And please, you know, let, let them do their job, blah, 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 blah. And so the Chili Peppers can finish their show. And, and that was it. And he walked off, from what I remember. And we played another song. And then, yeah, and then we're like, should we do fire? And then, that's all, and then yeah, yeah boom, played fire. Yeah, done, left. Get in the car, drive home. Next thing, nothing to hear anything about it. Next thing, I'm leaving him in the airport, and I look up at TV and the thing, and it's like, you know, news channels on. I'm last night at the Woodstock Festival, and the Jewel playing, and it was nice, and then this band playing, and everything was great. And then Chili Peppers took the stage. All hell broke loose. <laughs> it's just like CNN or something. I'm like... What? <laughs> they show these fires and people fly. I was like, holy shit. I had no idea. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh. And it looked like the way they put it together, like, yeah. like yeah. we were the instigators. You know, I was like, oh, okay, this is not going to be good. Yeah. But it, our, my point being our song choice wasn't to be in, in, in sight any sort of, yeah, it was of because of yeah. Hendrix's, Sister asked us to play one of the songs, and that's the one that which we is knew. which is a great honor. You think about yes. you know the impact that's why Hendrix we did had that's, that's really guys. why we did it. It's it huge. was like pay respect, and it was very yeah exactly. Yeah, that's so, amazing. You know, sorry people. You know, and and as you go through the two thousands, and the band is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You're playing <coughs> great places. What is what's a lesson that you would tell 18 year old Chad, you had a mentor right after that. So you had some great yeah. lessons in real time, yeah. but now looking back and now you are, you see a, a kid that is incredibly passionate yeah. and just out of high school, just out you. of high school. Yeah. Loves music more yeah. than anything in the world we yeah. do it for free yeah i did and then, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I know, it sounds familiar no, yeah. and and but now the wisdom you can bring to them is playing thousands of shows yeah high level being in a world famous band where you're learning all kinds of lessons that have nothing to do with drums and rudiments and and it all has to fit together you got to be as great a drummer as you've ever been or more and you have to understand the business side. And I don't just mean financial business. I just mean politics and dynamics and personalities, like yeah. all the layers that go into being part of what becomes a machine when a band gets really, really successful. It like leaves the roots of being a band, even though musically it might not, but business-wise and structure-wise, it becomes a big business. It becomes a machine. 
and all of these things that you learn, what what would you what's your advice? What's your what's your insight? Jeez, putting the pressure on me, baby. I, you know, it, 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 some of the things that you brought up is are, are important things. It's it's like, um, but is it you know? Is I I've thought about that, and when you're 18, you know, at least for me and a lot of the 18 year old I know, they don't know the fuck they are, what they want. Want to do Still too how to do? You're really a young person. You think you know everything, sort of, in your own ignorance, magical thinking yeah. mind. Right. I have children that are 19 and they know everything, and so. Um, but I think just to be like, um, these are things that you just learn over time. But just like you have to be like patient, a patient person, like. Um, and and um, I wasn't as very empathetic back then, and and I need I learned how to be think about other people more, be kind, be a kinder person. I was a little hard and a little, you know, I was a rebellious, you know. I felt like that was an important aspect to have to be like a rock and roll. The chip on your shoulder was part of the energy. I think right? so. A rebel. I that we yeah. all have when we're yeah, young. but like one of my rebelling, I didn't, I didn't grow up on the streets or anything. But, but it was like, I, you know, you're figuring out who you are, and and sometimes that you just can't become that without experiencing things. So I would say be open to like any kind of thing that 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 seems like it might be. Um, a learning experience and sometimes it's very challenging it's not like easy don't always take the easy road like do stuff that's hard because um that'll that'll you know that'll help you build character and and it's it's easy to do the, it's easier to do the things that you're kind of good at at that point the comfort zone they call it the comfort zone yeah. thank you yeah. and like so get out of it to get out of your comfort zone which most people don't like to be uncomfortable anyway right but like I think that that would be a good thing to 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 embrace that and be okay with it and not like be bitter or, or grumpy about it or whatever. Um, and 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 just like lead with your heart, you know, like and be a real person to um, not only to yourself as much as you can at that point. Um, again, I was like eighteen, man. It's like so green. You're just experiencing stuff, a lot of things, in for the first time. You leave, whether it's you go to college or whether or you leave the sort of nest of wherever you are for the first time, you're trying to figure out, like, just how to navigate through life. And I would, like, I would be kind of, I would be a little kinder to myself. I was a little hard on myself because I kind of wanted, it, you know, I wanted to be the best this or I wanted to, you know, be successful but I also wanted to be to be really good and earned for the right reason, and that, and that just back to what we said before, it doesn't come overnight. So you be patient with understanding that, like, you have to just you just gotta go through stuff because it's that's how life is. It's just you have to experience things, and experience comes to time and effort. Um, in the music business, I'm, I use an example where. When you're you're planting a seed to become a tree, right? At a certain point, no matter how much water you pour on it in a day, it's not going to grow faster, yes. right? There's that there's that point where that's, yes, that's you, a good analogy, and 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 that's in what fact, I've In fact, you could you could kill it, you could drown it, <laughs> you put over water, you can kill it. So it has to be the right. You have to have good balance in yeah. life. Just so enough. do other things too, like and that's another uh, that makes me think of like just like don't just do music i know that that's that's your what do passion you love to do that just, balances it what are you, you know what are you into when you're not drumming um it's a passion yeah i don't nothing as passionate as music but um i think that you're like, an artist you paint i do i like to do other other creative things and photography and I ride motorcycles, I like to scuba dive i like to golf oh, okay. i mean so you outdoors know, inspires you yeah i think so I'll, I'll, yeah, and it breaks up the grind of like you know playing this, yeah. the, being on tour and playing every day, and like you said, like how do you, you got to clear your head a little bit? 
And then, when we're young, we don't know that. We fill our head until it implodes, yeah. <laughs> and then we just go, ah, uh-huh. and then we just get back on our feet. No, that's young. what's needed because you didn't have that. You've been kind of in this. I got to go to school, and then when I graduate from school, do I keep going to school, or do I get a job, or what am I going to do? And then do I have a girlfriend, or where do I live? Like those, like just life stuff. Trying to figure that. That's like you've never had to do any of that. Like you've always been taking. Yeah. That my stamp, you know, That's I true. lived at my parents' house until yeah. and even after that. But, um, you know, yeah, you need to kind of get thrown into the real world a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and I think, yeah, the most important thing is, is just like be as self aware as you can. Again, 18, but like look around at other people. That person is doing something. I want to do like that person girl guy whatever that's like that's they're doing something right that's cool i want to how do they do that like and be curious and and not afraid and and um yeah be a curious person in the world yeah and then see what works and use the good stuff and try to discard the bad stuff (laughs) so gonna come is how you handle it you gotta stick with it. Perseverance. We talked about yeah. perseverance and just for sure. Loving what you do, and so yeah. that you know they yeah. always say if if you'll never have a job in your life if you love what you do, right? right? So that you still work, but it's towards a goal that's that's you know you're, you're you have passion for. So it's not like my my mom and dad worked to work and make a living. Right. So they worked every day and they had jobs. Yep. So I got a front row seat to exactly what I never wanted to do. Me too. Even though I love them and they were the reason that we're sitting here yep. on so many levels. And and But part of that reason was not just the love and the guidance, but it was also my seeing, okay, this is exactly what it, what happens to a lot of people. All my relatives, everybody I knew did did it the same way. They well, got that, that was that generation. That was kind of that post-war. Uh, yeah, you kind of you got a job and provided, and 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 you know, it's not if you didn't if you didn't. Well, that's you know, people don't. I think everyone has a passion. They just don't necessarily go for it. Go for it, or recognize it, or um, yeah. I mean, I, I, there's got to be something that you'd like, but rather, rather do than if maybe being a garbage man is what you want to do. That's like your passion. Great. We need them. Plumbers, right. whatever it takes. Right. But like. Um, but in my parents' case and your parents' case, I worked shared, for Ford Motor Company. Like he, he I saw him it, get up it was, six o'clock in the morning. Yeah, same here. Fuck yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing that shit. Right. Right. He would come on. I mean, I, he pretended like he liked it, but yeah, it's not. He didn't. No. That wasn't. It his wasn't thing. a passion. No, no. Fuck no. No, and that's what I think that is. You know, that's it. When you tap into that passion and you and you really take the leap, because you know Wayne Dyer, right? Great self help philosopher. Yeah. He used to always say, "Jump and the net will appear," and that's basically what you did. You went to L.A. and you jumped. I jumped. And in August. And in December, the net appeared. I know. Which you didn't even realize that was the net. Not right? at that point. Not at that point. Of course not. Nobody no. would. You're just, you're just trying to. six years later. Yeah. Yeah. No. 40 years into the band's yeah. you know, uh, anniversary, now it's all clear in hindsight. But at that moment, it was, uh, you know, it was really um, gutsy. Uh, every move was gutsy. Staying in Detroit, grinding for eight years in clubs was gutsy because you didn't know if that was going to be. You didn't know if your eighth year was your eighth year or eight of twenty years grinding in clubs. I mean, it's all in hindsight that we learn it. But what you did know is that you weren't going to stop until you got to where you saw yourself, which is making a living playing the drums mm-hmm. and loving what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And you didn't envision a rock funk band nope. <laughs> with this incredible bass player and this nope. iconic lead singer nope. and all these these nope. details that we now know. This yep. was this was just like, you know, I'm I love what I do. I'm not gonna stop. Yeah. You know, winners never quit, quitters never win. I mean, that's that that's it. You keep 
and, and, and you kind of make your break. And I think at some point, if you're just a, as as you're the, you just keep working, and be the best in your little town until yeah. Yeah. you've kind of exhausted the possibilities. I felt like in Detroit, I, I in eight years, I kind of knew everyone in my world. It was the limit, really. And I felt point. like I, I, as as we, like we got in this one band. And we got a record deal on RCA, and we put a record out, and it was a lot of like, oh my God, we're gonna be the next thing. Of course, we were all excited about it. Came out, did a little tour, did this and that, and it didn't take off, and we went uh, 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 back down to playing those clubs again. And my other guys in my band were like eight years older than me, and they had families, these little houses, and like, you know, and they're like 31, 32, and I'm like, this is gonna work for me. <laughs> I gotta like make a move. Right. I gotta do it. I think I they gotta. Bailed. I gotta do it now or never, sort of thing. So, to recognize that, yeah, that's a good thing to do. And it's, it is. It, you're right. It's a little. Yeah, I took a risk, and and but like, I don't. I never. I'm not the like. Oh, shoulda, coulda, woulda person. It's like, nah. I gotta do this. Right. Or, you know, or else I'll I'll just kind of stay here and with her on the Detroit Vine, which would have been not horrible, but like. Just a totally different life. I, yeah, a I totally just felt different like I, I needed to like see if I could really play with the fucking big boys to a certain aspect. And to get the opportunity, I didn't think I'd have the opportunity, but I was just like, I was like, who knows? Maybe I'll go to where it is. It's right. so at least it's <laughs> right, not going right. to come to the 24 Carat Lounge on Six Mile and Telegraph in Detroit. Like Sunset Ship or whatever, whoever, like Chili Peppers. So I'm going to go there and see if I can. It works, huh? So, we're, so in a separate video, check out, we've got Chad's current tour kit that we are doing a modern drummer rundown on, and you can see it in the video. And Chad's drum tech, Chris Warren, is taking us through it. But what I want to talk to you about, Chad, is the kit itself. It's got a really great story. And I'll, I'll set it up. You'll go to, you guys will go and you'll see the kit. It's in a million videos. It's in the Modern Drummer videos I just shared. But I saw it live and Carolina, my wife and I, we, we were looking at the kit. We were stage right and we're pretty close to it. And we were just taken back because it looked like a, a wooden furniture work of art. Like it didn't look like any other drum kit I had ever seen just the way that the textures of the wood and, and it just was very striking. Yeah. Um, but different striking than some of your other kits, which are very loud looking and, mm -hmm. and very, you know, the, the art aspect of them is, is very intricate. This was just a simple wood, but there was nothing simple about it. So how did we, how did you come to this kit? Well, um, the lovely people at DW are so nice and they, they, been giving me, making me drum sets for a while now. And um, I had, the last kit that I had was, was all silver, silver everything was silver, 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 everything had to be silver. And, it, but it, but the drum set was, is, I uh, forget what it's called, but it's like plies of maple and I think one ply of mahogany. And they have a name for it. Yeah, when I'm not too technical on a drum part. Chris is going to take care of that. Sorry about that. But I've been playing acrylic drums for a while before that. Oh, live. <clears throat> I love them. They're loud. They're, they're bright. They look cool. But I was like, well, I think it's time for a change. So I did the first part of this tour. I did the silver kit. It was awesome. Sad, great. Really fun. And then we put another record, Double Album Out, Unlimited Love. And it had some artwork on the cover of the record. And it was kind of psychedelic, cool looking stuff. And, I thought, oh, it would be nice to have that, incorporate that in the drum set. So, I had to do a rap. And same, um, same uh, wood configuration. And then they made the art that they wrapped it. And the company did the rap thing. And I don't know how thick it is, but they have to glue it and put it together. And so, I played that drum set once at a charity event. And was underwhelmed with, with, with the, with, I was so used to that silver kit, how good that that 
sounded and warm and punchy and loud. And but that was painted, not wrapped. So correct. Right. Okay. Correct. Yes, that was silver paint. And so I was like, and Chris, my longtime drum tech, he's he's a, he just loves every. He's very. He's a drum nerd, and he loves everything about the drums. And he's like, hey, like how are the drums? He's like, oh, they're pretty good. They're pretty, you know, I'm like, okay, cool. I get up there and we start playing. I was like, they sound good, but they're just not. Yeah, it's just you know when you sit down at a kit and it's like giving you. It almost speaks to you. Yeah, when, and this one, right. this one was just not. Um, it's a little muted, a little not as punchy, and I was like, God, that's weird. It's the same thing. It's the same. You know drums and Chris was like, "Yeah, I know it's not." Mm. And I'm been and I'm, I went up to our front of house guy, and it's like, "What do you? How the drums sound?" He was like, "Okay, <laughs> I can work with it." I'm like, "You can work with it?" So and this is not a slag on DW at all. They make some of the best drums ever, but. When you're used to a certain standard, and you're it was used their to, own standard, it was the <laughs> exactly. standard that they and set. And I'm only thinking it's because of the rap, because I hadn't done a drum set with the rap. And whenever you add anything to drums, it takes some of the resonance out. Not always, but it's a possibility. And so I said, "Fuck, man, we gotta, gotta do something." <laughs> So Chris is like, yeah, I think maybe we can get, there's this guy there that's a great painter. Maybe we can get him to paint something. won't be the same, but I'm like, okay, cool. So he's like, all right, I got to send the drums back to DW. And so Chris took all the the wrap off, and I don't know how he does it. You have to, how do you, I, don't even, I don't even know. Do they use like a Heat hot gun, gun or, or something? Or so? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the glue and the thing, and all. he finally got all the drums and, got all the glue off and they sent me a picture because he's a drum nerd on his like driveway of all the shells just by themselves and they're at this beautiful dark maybe the mahogany is the last is the outer ply i'm not sure there's like dark wood really rich looking and i don't know if it was the picture or whatever and i'm just looking at him like that looks fucking great like that those look like classy like a like nice furniture. They do, yeah. And he's like, I was I was, saying, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> We've never had just a wooden, bare wood drum set. Like yeah, that's not what you do. I, I I know, yeah. I was gotta put some fancy shit on. And he's like, pretty dope. I'm like, let's. And so we had. He goes, you know what would look really good, is is if we would have been doing the hardware. All the hardware, all the stands, pedals, every, I mean, he does, the stick holder, everything is this, um, it's a satin, I want to say, um, it's not, I think it's, I think it's bronze, but Chris can tell me for sure, and you have to have it plated somewhere else, DW doesn't do it, so we take it, these people that do it, so it's not shiny, it's not the shiny, it's a satin finish, and all the hardware, all the lug casings, everything. And so in that way, I mean, the gong stand, um, he even does like the roto-tom thing. Like he's a fucking nerd. It's great. So I just show up in the drums. I like looks and sound fantastic. So yeah, that's that's the kit now. And we've had this one a little over a year. I think it started, yeah, um, yeah over a year now. Um, and it maybe might even sound better than the silver one. Uh, for some reason, you just never, you know, all the wood is different, everything sure. different, but it would have never came to be if it, if, it, if we didn't, if I didn't try it out that one day and was, wasn't really happy with that sound and then ended up taking off the, the wrap and, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it sounds great. I mean, yeah, it sounds great. The, looks sounds great. great. You know, um, I'm very fortunate to have such a nice instrument to play and you start the show with hitting that giant gong giant gong so we're going to end this podcast 
<laughs> on about the gong because I, okay. I love that. I love yeah. that gong, man. It is just, uh, yeah. it's so, it sounds amazing and it looks so cool. Yep. And, you know, with the stage and just everything about it, we play such a visual instrument that when we can really bring the audience into it that closely, right? Yes. yes. And uh, yeah. so, what do you, what do you, it's, what's the size of the gong? That is a 58-inch symphonic gong from the Peisty family. And I, uh, yeah, at the beginning of this tour, I, I did switch to Peisty. It was a long time Sabian endorser, but I felt like it was time for something new. And um, I asked him, I said, I need a really big gong. <laughs> I've never had a gong. Uh and you know we're not playing clubs, and I thought let's let's go for it. And if you're gonna get a gong, get a big one. And I asked him, I asked Eric Peisty, what's the biggest one you make? I think he says we make it sixty. And I said, okay, great, that's what I want. And he was like, uh, I don't think we have any of those, Chad. I said, ah, oh, really? He goes, well, about like thirty-eight, like Bonham, and you know, and I keep moving. I was like, hmm. No, I really want a really <laughs> big one. <laughs> ah, and he's like, okay. So being the nice man that he is, and me being a new endorser, he wanted to help me out. He found uh, one that was like in the hallway of, you know, the Berlin Symphony or so, somewhere in Germany, <laughs> and he stole that demo and had it shipped. Because I said, great, we're starting a tour in Spain and, you know, whenever it was, June. And he's like, okay, great, I'll get it to you. I'm like, oh, fantastic, so excited. And they have to ship the gong, and it's very large and heavy. And this was like just post-COVID time, so things were kind of yeah. weird with the shipping, and it just ended up never getting through customs. Every city we would go to, it would arrive the next day, and then we'd go to the next city. So I didn't have my gong for <laughs> I don't know, about a week, but that's okay. When it came, it, it was great, and, and we start the show, and I, I warm it up a little bit, give it a good bang, and then we hit an E chord, and we're off. And there's some other parts that I find I can, like, um, a few other songs that I was like, okay, this this kind of work. I could, I could sneak it in here and there. But it is. It's a big... And loud. ...wave of sound. It's yeah. a little overwhelming, I, like... In the song, it's like an ending and something. You can kind of get away with that. Bah, bah, bah. But like, you kind of watch it where, where you, you try to. It's a hard to. It's hard to sneak in anywhere. It's just, yeah. which is awesome, but it has to be the right spot. Anyway, but it looks fucking cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, Chad, and people met. listen with their eyes. Well, and often, yeah. I didn't tell you. I mean, people were like, "Yeah, you, I think you're a really good drummer. The way you can spin those sticks, and sometimes you throw them up and catch them. You're really good." <laughs> <laughs> and that, and you know, but we're it, entertainment is uh, is as Part important it. as it's, it's it, absolutely it's you know. Visual I'm medium. It away, but I'm like, that's it. That makes it good. Okay, <laughs> practice your juggling, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Chad Smith, thank you very much for taking the time today, man. My pleasure. Great to see you. Love you, brother. Love you too. Yeah, man. Modern drummer, thanks for watching. Chad Smith, check him out. Back on tour with the Chili Peppers. Check out Chad Smith, Modern Drummer Legends. And uh, we'll see you again soon. I'm David Frangioni. Well, you guys take for hours. Well, shut up. <laughs>